Okay, hello and good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, today I am speaking to uh, Trita Parsi. He's the uh, co-founder and president of the uh, National Iranian American Council. He's the vice executive vice president of the Quincy Institute and he's also a historian. He wrote an interesting book called Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran and the Triumph of Diplomacy. It's one of his many books expert on geopolitics in Iran, and he actually happens to be Iranian, which is also important, <laughs> um, I would think. So, uh, Trita Parsi, uh, welcome to your channel. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, Trita, I want to sort of just get into the whole topic of Iran. We've seen protests for the last few weeks following the death of uh, Masa Amini. Um, and let's start sort of with the with the history of the topic. And it's, it's a very basic question. I think some people already know the answer. But why is there a difficult relationship between Iran and the United States? Well, it's a <clears throat> big, big topic, of course, and there's plenty of different reasons for it. Um, I think the, the reasons that are the least understood and least discussed are the ones that are based on the geopolitical considerations. Um, the ones that are easy to understand, the ones that are more surface level um, and easily to grasp is the fact that, of course, Iran had a revolution. It ended up becoming quite anti-American. The United States had been a big supporter of the Shah, despite his massive human rights abuses. The United States had ensured that the Shah was in power because the United States and Britain conducted a coup against the democratically elected prime minister of Iran in 1953. The United States had early on actually been an interesting ally of Iran's in the sense that it was a major anti-colonial power and was quite skeptical and opposed to what Britain and some of the big powers had done in Iran and elsewhere in the world. But um, due to the dynamics of the Cold War, man, more than anything else, perhaps, uh, it ended up going in the direction of favoring regime change. I mean, back in the Cold War, the, the regime change business in the United States was extensive. And the, the one they uh, committed in Iran was considered one of the cheapest and most successful ones. Uh, apparently only costing $10,000. So all of that has created, unfortunately, a, a, a very bad dynamic. And then, of course, you had the revolution happening, the Iraq-Iran war. The Iranians took 52 Americans hostage for 444 days. The United States supported Saddam Hussein in many different ways, including providing him with intelligence, uh, as well as turning a blind eye and at times even encouraging Saddam Hussein to use uh, mm -hmm. uh, chemical gas against the Iranians. And then, uh, but since then, there's some very fascinating things that have happened. You have a situation in which there's been elements inside of Iran who have recognized that even though they may be opposed to much of the U.S.'s uh, conduct in the Middle East, they certainly oppose the U.S. being a major power, meaning having a, a military hegemony in the Middle East. They nevertheless also recognize the need to have a better relationship with the United States, that Iran's access to the West, to technology, to finance, etc., uh, which is necessary for its own development, is being limited because of this bad relationship. And through the 1990s till uh, very recently, of course, um, there's been numerous attempts by both sides to be able to improve the relationship. Some of the more famous uh, episodes go back to, um, uh, for instance, in 1989, during his inaugural address, George Bush Sr., um, uh, said that goodwill begets goodwill. If Iran takes a positive step, there will be an endless spiral that could improve uh, relations between the two sides. The Iranians interpreted that as a signal of if Iran helps put pressure on Hezbollah to release American hostages in Lebanon, that uh, the United States would reciprocate, and, and the Iranians did this. There's a fantastic book by the UN diplomat Gian Domenico Pico, uh, a man without a gun, I think it's called diplomat. Yeah, man without a gun. How he negotiated this release, and it was very much uh, from the Iranian side, motivated by a desire to improve relations. Um, and then when, <clears throat> but then unfortunately that didn't happen. Uh, the United States even received some help from Iran against Saddam Hussein in the Persian Gulf War. But then the geopolitics had changed in a different way for the Israelis, who put a lot of pressure on the United States to isolate and contain Iran, even though they actually had been pressuring the United States to talk to Iran many years earlier. So this major opening by the Iranians ended up not getting responded to. And it wasn't so much an active decision on the American side. I interviewed several of the people who were involved in the government at the time. 
Now, I think the context there is important to understand. 1992, the United States was the unipolar power, the unipolar moment. The entire world was on the United States' side. The fact that Iran wasn't, you know, it was just not a major issue for them. So it wasn't necessarily so much an active rejection of Iran as, frankly, neglect. But it nevertheless was costly to the Iranians. They didn't give up. Um, and one of the calculations they had, one of the lessons they learned was that if they actually create a common area of economic benefit for the two sides, then it might be easier to build a common political um, uh, project on it as well. Was, so was first... this thinking um, similar to Nixon opening up China, you know, that, that sort of approach that we're just going to trade well, the... and then see how it plays out later? Uh, well, I think that the Nixon goes to China was a bit more ambitious and it was a bit more, um, I mean, it, it is a fascinating move uh, uh, politically because essentially the Shanghai Declaration say, we disagree on all of these things, but we're still going to have to have a good relationship be, within this framework. So it was an extremely mature uh, and politically uh, courageous decision uh, by both sides. Now, of course, it was motivated by the Cold War. What you had with the opening that the Iranians tried to create by giving, uh, because what they did was they concluded the necessity of an economic opening is that when they opened up Iranian oil and gas fields for foreign exploration, the first one they offered it to was to Conoco, an American company. And that was a deliberate move. Conoco had been negotiating with the Iranians for more than two years. They had kept the State Department abreast of these developments. But by the time the deal was struck, you had now a different situation because now the Israelis have, um, uh, the, the, the U.S. policy towards the Middle East was centered on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The Iranians uh, were opposed to the Oslo Agreement. The Israelis were doing everything they could to isolate and sanction Iran. So it came at a time in which now there was an active rejection by the United States. The Clinton administration was under a lot of pressure to reject the uh, Conoco deal, which he did through two executive orders. Um, and the Iranians were completely stunned because this was not a, this was a two plus year negotiation that had taken place. The Conoco itself was stunned. They had kept the State Department abreast of all of these different things. But then it becomes Iran's turn to miss an opportunity. In 1998, the United States under Clinton, now in his second term, he was really desperate for some sort of a foreign policy win, particularly mindful of the fact that Oslo Accord had gone uh, astray. Uh, and there was this outreach to the Iranians. Khatami had to become president. They sensed an opening. Um, Madeleine Albright gave the speech in which she came as close to apologizing for 1953 as you could without using the word apology. Right. Um, but then at the time, yeah, you know, uh, the infighting inside of Iran did not allow the Iranians to say yes to this. And I know many folks in Iran only years later, deeply regretted it because they saw what came afterward, which was the Bush administration, the war on terror, putting Iran in axis of evil. And all of that came incidentally after the Iranians deeply helped the United States in Afghanistan against the Taliban, not just to defeat them. I, I, I want to yeah. point to that because you've mentioned now a few times where um, Iran and America helps each other, even though, you know, officially they're opposed to each other. And I had a Conversation here with uh, it's a general, a former commander of, of not general, I think he's commander of AFCOM, where um, Chris Chris Hyatt at the Pennsylvania War College, and he made the argument to me that the tragedy between America and Iran is that they're actually natural allies, that they share so many um, common interests geopolitically, and yet they cannot, you know, get to the point where they almost both accept us. But the real polity plays out. Um, or the way the real policy plays out is that often in the areas where there's competition, they are sometimes forced to collaborate because of the common interest. I agree partly with this. I think it's a very interesting thought. Here's where I uh, see things a bit differently. I don't see them as natural allies, but that's because I don't believe there's such a thing as natural allies. Um, because that necessitates that there's also naturally enemies. And, and right. I think geopolitics is much more fluid than that. So that, that's just on the, like a theoretical principle level. But I think where the reason is where I think there isn't that kind of commonality is because the United States has, since the middle of the 1990s minimum, had an explicit ambition 
of being the military hegemon of the Middle East. So at that level, they are clashing. Iran will reject American hegemony, Chinese hegemony, Russian hegemony, any other hegemony. Um, and, you know, and the Iranians in the past certainly have desired to have their own hegemony. I think at this point, it's very clear that that's not the, the real objective. There may be some fantasies in Iran. Iran has no capacity to have hegemony. Iran has the capacity of preventing it from being completely isolated. And I think that's the containment is much more of a guiding principle rather than hegemony. Now, certainly the Shah um, was in a position of power and used the language of primacy uh, and, and hegemony um, uh, and, and believed strongly, and it's part of the Iranian identity, that because of the fact that Iran has been a regional superpower for 3,000 years, it's the natural role of Iran to be at least a major power in the region. So here's where I think the analysis needs to get a little bit more sophisticated. At that level of hegemony on the region, they are clashing. They have common interests at a lower level when it came to dealing with the Taliban uh, and many other issues. But because of the clash over this issue, which also is intertwined with the paranoia on the Iranian side, a paranoia that is, by the way, not entirely un unjustified, which is that the United States is looking for regime change in Iran. Yeah. That means that even tactical collaboration on other issues have significant limitations because why would you want to help a power that you believe ultimately is looking for your regime to fall? So even though you can collaborate at times, there's a limit to it because you don't want the other country to get too comfortable because you believe that when they're comfortable, they're going to come after you. But, but do the Iranians then interpret a rapprochement as a um, that, that do they interpret that the rapprochement will inevitably lead uh, to their own demise, or is, is that well, the, some of them do? Mystic? Some of them do, um, but others believe that through some form of rapprochement, uh, the U.S.'s inclination towards regime change can also be changed, because then you have a better way of being able to emphasize the common interest there. But I do believe that unless the top line item is not resolved, which is the combination of an existential perception of threat that the regime has and the fact that they are seeking, if not dominance, at least the, the prevention of dominance of the other in the same territory, as long as that is not resolved, there isn't any such thing as a natural alliance because then the U.S. actually feels much closer to Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia has been supporting terrorism that has targeted the United States, does a lot of different things that undermine the U.S.'s position and interest. But Saudi Arabia wants American hegemony in the Middle East. It begs for it. It needs it because it cannot protect itself without the United States. The Emirates, same position. Even the Israelis. The Israelis actually don't need American hegemony, but they certainly are better off with it. It's, it, it expands their maneuverability. So on that level, those countries are actually much more aligned. And there's plenty of people in Washington who see that as much more important than whether there is a tactical uh, um, common interest between the United States and Iran and Afghanistan or Iraq, et cetera, et cetera. And incidentally, that clash has also then negatively affected how they deal with each other in Afghanistan and in Iran. The Iranians did everything they could to make sure that the United States failed and bled in Iraq. Because their calculation was, which was not incorrect, that if the United States was successful in Iraq, Iran was next. In Afghanistan, where they actually... But that, that was actual U.S. policy, though. I mean, Wesley Clark... Right, and... that's they were not wrong in their, yeah. in their perception of what the U.S. Would, would do. But also, by doing everything they could to undermine the United States, they also made sure that the enmity became even deeper. In Afghanistan, they had far greater common interests. Uh, but there they ended up undermining each other as well, uh, to the detriment of both the United States, clearly after 20 years had to leave uh, in disgrace. The, uh, the interest of the Iranians has been perhaps most importantly to the detriment of the Afghans. The Afghans would have been in a much better position if the United States and Iran actually collaborated. There. Not addressing the fact that the issue of how the United States defines its sphere of influence and Iran defines it and how it's overlapping and clashing I think has caused a lot of people to miss where part of the root of this conflict is. And it's been focused on uh, not unimportant issues, but more surfical, surfical issues without addressing the core of the issue. 
So, so you, um, would you make think, the argument then that the root of the issues lies in geopolitics as opposed to what we hear in the media, which is often Iran as a theocracy with internal repression and who wants to dominate the uh, um, region? And some go as far as they say, and I, I know it sounds absurd just saying this, they want a nuclear bomb just to bomb Israel. You know, um, I mean, name, name a single friend of the United States in the region that doesn't repress its own people, or in the case of Israel, occupies an entire other country and other people for now more than uh, 70 years, or doesn't, you know, so this is not a defense of Iranian human rights violations, it's just that the argument that that is the reason why there isn't uh, a better relationship it is unconvincing to me, because it would be convincing to me if the United States actually, A, either only had democracies as friends, which would be a very short list, or B, actually did something to um, uh, uh, move these countries in a democratic direction. And I'm not talking about snail pace stuff, but actually real significant stuff. I mean, the countries that the United States actually has leverage over to push them on human rights are not countries like Iran that the U.S. has no trade with, no relationship with. It's countries like Saudi Arabia that are completely dependent on the United States for their security. And, and, so and Egypt. When we you know, have that yeah. leverage and refuse to use it, and yeah, there's plenty of other examples. Um, um, Egypt is a, a very good one as well there. Uh, when we have the leverage and are not using it, then it certainly becomes unconvincing that that is a particularly important factor uh, in the formulation of American foreign policy. But why is it that people who engage themselves with foreign policy um, always interpret realism or geopolitics in this harsh and, and cold sense of only self-interest. And you can argue to an extent human rights only becomes implemented as a means of convenience. What, what, why does that you know, play itself out? And why is it that the people who make those decisions seem to embrace only that ideology, for lack of a better word? So I don't quite know what you mean. You mean that people, that countries well, give I mean, it, service it, it, to... You, yeah, they give. I assume that somebody who works in the State Department for the United States would look at Saudi Arabia and Egypt and see there is an oppression. We can we have leverage. We sell them weapons. We can force them to become more democratic in certain ways. Of course, we can't intervene all the way. Understandably, the situation is complex. Um, but it's as if the analysts of geopolitics only look at the world, you know, through the lens of real politic. I mean, it's, it's a very tragic way of looking at it. Um, there's plenty of people in the government that are quite unhappy with uh, many of these policies, would like to change them. But at the end of the day, um, reality is, if the United States were to do this on a large scale, much of the infrastructure of alliance systems that they have, uh, that the United States has built, would uh, more or less fall apart. So I'm not saying that in a singular case, the cost is overwhelming. But in the broad scale, it, it would be a major reorientation of American foreign policy. In my view, in many ways, it could be a good one. I don't believe, however, that any country will pursue their foreign policy in this type of a world uh, based on human rights. I think the countries that tend to be the most credible on human rights are the ones that also have the least influence, have the least geopolitically important position in the world, and as a result, can afford it. Yeah. Um, I won't name the name, but a major country, a very senior diplomat from a major country that is now a rising power, um, I was having conversations with him, and, and he pointed out that the foreign policy of their past, which was very idealistic and they were very strong on human rights, etc., is not going to be the case any longer because now we're too powerful. It cost us to do this. Right. It was different when we were irrelevant because the countries we criticized looked at us, they smiled, it's like, yeah, you can say that, but it doesn't matter. Now when it matters, suddenly it carries a cost. Mm -hmm. I know it's a very crude way of looking at the world, and it's not an argument that this is the way things should be. This is an argument that this is the way the thing, the way things are. And I think the biggest danger is if one, you know, falls for some sort of illusion that these things actually are the driving force of foreign policy. It's not. There was a very fascinating memo that was leaked during the Trump administration, uh, allegedly written by Brian Hook at the policy planning uh, department. 
that was very explicit that the United States now needs to be much more disciplined in pursuing human rights as an instrument to beat up American enemies and be much, much more quiet about human rights when it comes to American allies and partners. The fascinating thing with that document was not that it says that this would be a new policy. Um, it was an acknowledgement that that is the policy, yeah. but it just has to be sharper than it has been in the past. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a basic justification of, of the hypocrisy, and then you're making the argument that geopolitics just forced them to be in that position because they're so powerful. I sort, I sort of want to pivot you back to Iran, and maybe we should get a little bit to the internal oppression in Iran because we say Iran has... I mean, uh, certainly the Iranian elite believes the Americans are getting out, out to get them. I don't think they're always wrong. America has tried to instigate regime change in, region, in Iran. But certainly that cannot excuse the internal oppression that many Iranians um, experience, right? For example, the, the status of women, which is now in, in dispute. And so the question I would say, ask you here is, what type of reforms do you think is feasible within Iran, you know, given all these constraints that we talk about? Um, I think we're now in a situation in which the belief in the path of reform has become extremely weakened to the point that it is no longer um, supported in the way that it was before. In fact, momentum appears to be on the side that believes that that path needs to be abandoned altogether. Um, and look, when you take a look at what has happened in the last 20 years in Iran, the political spectrum in Iran today is narrower than it was 20 years ago. People talk about the Khatami years as some sort of a golden era compared to what it is now. And this is a consecutive process. Now, there's been successes, but those successes have been reverse and some of them have evaporated. I think one of the major successes was the JCPOA. And it was a major project of the reformists and the centrists who believed and argued that if the Iranians managed to come to some form of an agreement with the United States, it would open up the way for Iran's development. If Iran compromised, the United States would compromise. And people bought, bought into it. And lo and behold, it was successful. The deal was struck. And it was a genuine compromise. The Iranians gave. They gave a lot. But so did the United States. It was not just an achievement for them and for the Europeans and others who have brokered it, but it was an achievement for multilateral diplomacy. But then two years later, the United States pulls out of the agreement. And at first, one could make the argument, well, that's, that's Trump. Trump is an aberration. Um, it's, it's just extreme bad luck. But then Biden comes in. And instead of quickly going back into the deal and saving as I believe he could have done through an executive order. There would have been issues that needed to be resolved. Iran had expanded its program, there's, there's things, but the United States would have been able to deal with those issues from within the JCPOA rather than from outside. But that's not the path Biden chose. Instead, he spent the first 10, 12 weeks consulting with Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, the only three countries that opposed the deal in some sort of a belief that he could convince them to be okay with. And by the time he came back to the, to the table, the atmosphere was already poisoned. Iran was close to its elections, and the opportunity was, to a very large extent, lost. Now, negotiations continued, and the Iranians lost several opportunities down the road. But in my SMS assessment, the biggest mistake, the biggest lost opportunity, the biggest one that cost um, uh, the JCPA is the fact that Biden didn't just go back in. What that did to the reformists, I think, has been widely misassessed and underestimated because it showed to a lot of people, rightly or wrongly, that it wasn't Trump that was the aberration. It was Obama. Because Trump pulled out, Biden stayed out until this day, the, the, the Trump sanctions are in place. It was Obama that was an aberration. And Obama was some sort of an extremely unusual American president, and it won't happen again. And as a result, the idea that you could make a deal with the United States that would last 
has now lost a tremendous amount of um, uh, yeah. confidence in Iran. And with that, it has further weakened the reformers to the point of political irrelevance almost. Because even that one victory they had turned out to be shallow, fleeting, and non-sustainable. But not and this is that. something that the conservatives are used extensively in the 2021 election. Not that those elections were real elections, but it was an argument that was used extensively that I think to a large extent also contributed to the fact that a very large number of people didn't go and vote, wouldn't even have gone and vote likely if there was a more potent reformist candidate because they had already lost faith in the idea that that path, whether internal reform or external foreign policy reform, would work. Yeah, I, I want to substantiate that because um, um, I was traveling in Iran after the death of Qasem Soleimani, which also played a role into this, mm. by the way. Um, I could not find a single street vendor, okay? And you know, 60-70% of Iranians work on the streets who did not have a portrait of him in, um, you know, on, this, on, on their shelves. It was as if the support was, I, 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 maybe it's a fake support in, by the government, if that's the case, they, I fell for it. But I believe it was genuine. There was a genuine sense by many Iranians that I spoke to and I traveled through the country that you can't trust the United States. And therefore, why should we believe to these reformists? Why should we believe the people we've been listening to them and look at the treatment we just got? Yeah. yeah. And look, um, my argument is not that um, it's only because of this that the reformists yeah. have failed. I think you know there was systematic efforts by the hardliners in Iran to destroy them and one by one, you know, I mean, just simple things as not allowing some of them to run for a position in parliament, not allowing some of their key people to be able to run for president, to even be quoted in the media. I mean, there's been an extremely undemocratic effort to uh, eliminate them from the political scene. And we see the result of that. What happens is that people then be like, well, there's, if there's no path to reform, then down with the regime. That's the only path left. Yeah. And now the regime has to deal with that crisis that they themselves are ultimately responsible for having created, not just because, of course, the killing of Massa and many of the others, but because they themselves have created a situation in which people have no faith any longer that there is any path within the system that can change the system. But what do you say then to those who like preach this language of revolution and, and violence and things that want to topple a government? And, and my problem with that language is I saw what it did in Egypt. I saw what it did in Zimbabwe. Um, you know, it, it caused, it created a regime that was much worse than, you know, what replaced uh, what came before it. So, you know, is, is that a, uh, I mean, I have that fear. What, what, what do you make to that argument? I understand the desperation of the people. I, I totally yeah. get that. But I am highly skeptical of what some of them are advocating for. So in my assessment, I think it's important to make a distinction I'm, you know, A, you're hearing definitely from people on the inside, you know, just get rid of the regime. At least that's very clear from the protesters. How reflective that is of the broader uh, public opinion, of course, we don't have uh, reliable data necessarily. But um, I personally don't doubt that it is widely supported. But I'm not seeing that necessarily translating into them wanting to pursue violence. In fact, the majority of the protests have been very, very peaceful and the violence has come from the regime. There's some exceptions to that, but the overwhelming majority. What I'm hearing when it comes to what you just said is mostly from some folks in the diaspora. And I think there's an important distinction to be made from what people on the inside are saying and doing and what some elements on the outside are saying and doing. And by the way, they have a right to say and have their opinion on these issues. It's just that it's important to make a distinction whether that is also, if it coincides with the demands yeah. from the inside. I mean, one demand in particular, the idea that Iran should be kicked out of the World Cup. I'm not seeing, I've not seen a single protest in Iran that has said anything about that. There's some voices in Iran that I have, but the idea that this is you know, part of the agenda of the protest, I've seen no evidence for it. But it's become something that some elements on the outside are rallying. Or even the issue of uh, the JCPOA. Um, some people say, you know, as one of the demands, there should be no JCPOA. Well, first of all, there's not much happening on the JCPOA front in the first place. But, but more importantly, I'm not hearing people in the protest in Iran either expressing support for the JCPOA or opposition. 
They're not yeah. talking about it. It's some people on the outside talking about it. But people yeah. inside don't seem to... Uh, they've I, gone I, beyond I, this. It's not an issue for them. These protests are not about that. So that, we... Have, that was again, my... Have, my um, to say it rapidly, that was sort of going to be my next question. Yes, yeah, the distinction between the diaspora and those outside. And I, I want to add another factor in here, which is, uh, you know, we can't talk about this without talking about the MEK. And, mm -hmm. you know, these people that show up in the media, experts on Iran and... No Iranian inside of Iran has often heard of them, um, you know, and I, I see they've even attacked you and some people who have been a little bit more sanguine on this question. Oh, there, there's a significant campaign going on right now to try to eliminate uh, all voices that are not buying into, you know, whatever more uh, hard line some folks on the outside have, have taken. And again, look, they're totally entitled to their opinion, to their agenda. It's just important to recognize that's their agenda it's not necessarily the agenda of the protesters inside and this can become a problem if you are seeing efforts to hijack the movement it's, i thought it was very fascinating early on in the protest there were explicit slogans against the idea that someone from the outside is leading this uh even in the protest in 2019 you could hear things such as you know uh praise of the old shah uh, uh, slogans in favor of the uh, the crown prince, um, as he's referred to. Uh, this time around, the slogan has been, we don't need a leader, uh, a supreme leader, nor do we need a shah, uh, which is an explicit rejection of some of these agendas coming from the outside. Um, but I, I think the more we focus on exactly what the people in Iran and what these protests want and what they're going for, I think the clearer the picture becomes. I don't see the uh, the outside voices being particularly influential in determining. They are unfortunately in some ways very much um, what some governments on the outside are necessarily relying on. Um, and we've seen some examples of that. Uh, so for instance, when Justin Trudeau tweets that Iran has uh, ordered 15,000 protesters to death, turns out, of course, that was not true, unfortunately. Uh, the latest news I heard is that it's at five uh, death sentences so far, and that's mm -hmm. five too many. Uh, but it's not good to um, uh, come up with uncontent, you know, unconfirmed information. Yeah, it's, it's, it's propaganda, you know. Yeah, but it, it, it lose, you know, Justin Trudeau loses credibility, and, and that's not good for him or for um, those who want to see democracy in Iran. Um, but this is is coming because of. You know, an atmosphere has been created in which facts are not supposed to be validated. In fact, facts are not that important. Uh, it's a non-fact based uh, narrative. And, and the sad thing is what the regime is doing right now is horrible enough as it is. I mean, the number of more than 300 people killed is, is horrific. There's no need to exaggerate that. That in and of itself stands uh, as, as a terrible, terrible example of what the regime does. Um, so... I, I fear that you know the the conversation has become uh, on the on the outside again. I want to make a distinction. This is not what I'm seeing happening on the inside. On the outside has become anti-intellectual, um, anti-facts based uh, group thing, and all of that ultimately is extremely unhelpful um, uh, to the protesters inside. Yeah, and 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 it's um, no, I, I definitely definitely agree there. I want to um, just ask you another question that that needs a little bit of nuance. And that is the role of the um, opposition groups within Iran. And I'm going to put you to the minorities, the Kurds, the Baluch speakers. Um, there's been also an attempt to try and trump up this protest as a form of separatism. Now, my personal experience going to the Kurdish areas has been that and I've been to, I've, I've talked to Kurds from different countries, you know, they've split in four countries. I, I've made the statement and some inside Iran would agree with me, outside may be different, that I think the Kurds in Iran are some of the best treated Kurds in the Middle East. Doesn't mean it's perfect or anything, but compared to Turkey, I think there's less oppression. So I'd like, just like to have your view also on, on, on this narrative that there is also a minority issue, and I guess it extends to the Turks as well. Well, there, there is minority issues in Iran. There's absolutely no doubt about it. I think the Kurds and many other ethnic, religious, religious even more so, frankly, uh, and minorities have been systematically mistreated. Um, but I think it's also important to be a little bit cautious here because 
I do believe that there are elements inside the regime itself who wanted to turn these protests into something uh, that looked as if it was driven by separatist courage, something like that. That's a way of securitizing the situation uh, in order to repress completely legitimate demands for dignity and freedom. Uh, so I think there's been elements inside the regime that wanted to do this. I think, unfortunately, there are elements outside of the country. And I'm not talking about diaspora now. I'm talking, I mean, looking at John Bolton's uh, interview, I think he knew that he lied, but I think he knew exactly what he was doing. He was yeah. saying that, you know, these things are coming from Kurdistan and, you know, uh, um, talking about um, uh, that they have weapons and they are being trained, etc., this is because he actually wants the regime to use much more violence against Kurd, uh, the Kurds of Iran in order to bring this towards some form of a Syria scenario or even worse. I mean, this is what John Bolton has been doing his entire career in the Middle East. When he's being asked whether he think Iraq, the Iraq war was a success or a failure, he doesn't flinch and he doesn't lie. He says it was a success. And people are shocked, but like, you know, Iraq is destroyed. It's not a democracy. Exactly. That was never his objective. He never actually even used a democracy language. From his perspective, he wanted to take Iraq off of the geopolitical chessboard. Make sure that it is not a threat or has a capacity of projecting power in a way that is problematic for the United States or some of its key allies. in the region. And in that sense, it was a success. Because Iraq, one of the most powerful countries in the Arab world, is now hardly a state. So from Bolton's perspective, it was an utter success. And it's exactly what he wants to do with but, Iran. But there's, well. there's, there's a, I mean, the numbers are disputed, but anything between 100,000 to a million dead people in, uh, as a result of that move that he justifies, you know. I mean, how he can, but he just comes, you know, it, it's a very callous statement. You know, to make yeah, but you're, you're being very charitable to Bolton right now because you assume that he cares about dead Iraqis. I don't think he cares the slightest. So for him, it doesn't, it doesn't matter at all. And I think this, this is why, um, and, and, you know, it was only a couple of months ago in which he was on American TV and says that, you know, um, there was a conversation about whether regime change was being planned. I don't remember against what country. And he said, well, I've done this several times. And this is how you do it. Well, he has. <laughs> He's not lying. But I think it's so. I think it's very important to um, prevent those type of elements from the outside. Most of them actually not from the community or the diaspora, from taking advantage of indigenous, legitimate protest in Iran for dignity and freedom, and co-opt them and turn them into something that these protesters never had any intention of. In fact, and when you take a look at it, so much of what the protesters are saying is actually non-political because yeah. they're, th these are teenagers. You know, in all, so many of the protests in Iran, we heard slogans such as, uh, forget about Palestine, think about us, a, a, a critique of Iranian foreign policy. You're not hearing that now at all. You're not hearing anything of this because these are very young people who are protesting because they want to have the same freedoms that you can have, not just in the West, but in many other countries in the Middle East. So if there are elements on the outside, other countries, et cetera, who are trying to co-opt this and turn it into Syria, and there are elements inside of Iran, I'm talking from the regime itself, and they actually want to do that as well. That's the biggest risk I see right now. Mm. I just have the, the last question here, because we're running end of time. Um, are you hopeful that, um, I mean, these protests that at least, you know, the equality of women and, and things of this sort will be taken more seriously in the future in Iran? Because I've seen Iranian TV debate these issues now. Uh, to an extent, they're still trying to, you know, play down the narrative. Um, but th there has been some debate, even from those in favor of the regime, I think, that, that at least the brainwaves have, have opened up. And do you think some of these issues might somehow circulate through the power structures and they come to reform the system? It can. And in some ways, I don't believe there's any return to what existed in the past. And that in and of itself can be a major victory for the protesters. But there's <coughs> sorry, a lot of other factors at play here that um, can complicate the picture. 
on the one hand, yes, I don't see there to be a return to the old past. But take a look at, for instance, how MBS handled the issue of allowing women to drive, a movement that had been conducted in Saudi Arabia for quite some time. He allowed it. He changed it. He celebrated it. He took credit for it. And then he imprisoned almost all of the women activists who had pushed for it for more than a decade, right? In order to make sure he gets the credit. Right. Uh, so you may end up having a situation in which the regime perhaps changes some of these things. They probably won't do it in the short term, um, you know, whether it's the morality police. And that's not going to be satisfactory to a lot of people, by the way. They want much more than that, but it might satisfy some. But it, it can very well end up being combined with a, in a horrible uh, clampdown, massive human rights abuses against some of the people who have been leading this charge in order to get that change. So it's, uh, it's my, it's, my, my view on the, on the issue of women is this, okay? If you look at mathematics graduates and science graduates in Iran, women are 60, 70%. It's higher than any European country. I think only Tunisia is higher, which is mm. you know, also a Muslim country. Um, the status of women is often a consequence of urbanization. It's got very little to do with authority and stuff. The Iranian government, in a sense, was the architect of their own demise when they started educating women and they started... Um, you know, developing the country because there was development that took place. You know, I know some people don't like hearing that. And uh, I think it is a matter of time, as you say, but how it will play out, I mean, yeah. the Ben Salman thing scares me a little bit. Yeah, no, again, again I, I, when you take that long-term perspective, I, I agree with you that, you know, um, it's difficult to see the trends not going in the right direction. But that doesn't mean that it may not be um, a very costly path, that it will not be, it will not be a clear-cut picture you may end up having some more social freedoms and then far more political repression elsewhere. Um, you know, uh, so it, it, it's a complicated picture. It's, I think it's important to be hopeful, but it's one of the things that to me, uh, I was hoping to see something different by now, which is um, that perhaps out of this movement, some sort of leadership from inside would emerge. Perhaps there is, and I miss it and many others have missed it. But without some form of leadership, it's it. There's going to be a lot of challenges. It's going to be more difficult to resist and, and push back against efforts by malign interests from the outside. And again, I'm talking about other countries who will take advantage of, uh, and who for years have been seeking not only to destabilize Iran, but uh, explicitly wanted to see Iran uh, disintegrate into several different countries. Um, but also in the in the sense of making sure that. If you have all of this support, how do you channel it into a clear political agenda that you can pursue um, and, and be able to get some form of a transition? Um, you can have potentially a complete collapse of the regime. I don't see it likely in the short term. But we've seen that in the past. The quest that is difficult to achieve. But what's even more difficult to achieve is that after that point, you actually have a transition towards something better. There's very few countries who've achieved that. Yeah, you know, very few uh, countries. Iran failed miserably. Now, of course, back then they had leadership and everything else, and it still failed. So it's not uh, as if that is the only I mean, even even order. South Africa, I mean, we had a success. We often held up as a success. But our yeah. advantage is the military defected. Um, mm. That did not happen in Egypt. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, no, yeah, no, not at all. Anyways. Um, Look, um, and I, in, I think... in, some, in, in many uh, Eastern European uh, or other countries, We've seen that when there is a collapse of the regime, but not a very well-organized opposition with leadership, what oftentimes ends up is that there will be a different regime coming, but that regime will come from the deep state and the intelligence services of the old regime. And they're the ones that end up being the leading figures. Now, perhaps that would still uh, be better than what the Iranians are dealing with right now. It's just that, you know, Last time there was a revolution, it was a massive step back in many different ways. It would be a tremendously shameful thing, a sad thing, if all of these courageous young people that are fighting for ideals of freedom and dignity, um, if their courage is not channeled the right way with the right leadership to actually make sure that they, that they get a better rather than worse future. Well, I, I guess the answer to that, so sort of end with this point, is um, the Iranian regime will have to find ways to reform itself. 
Um, it's impossible, and very rigid from where you and I are standing at the moment, but better things have happened, you know, so, yeah. Anyways, Trita Parsi, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you.